Today's video is going to be a true Cinderella story with the stepmother and all. Before we get into today's video though, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance in hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you're all having an amazing day. So it is 2021. Hello, happy new year. How are you guys feeling? Let me know down below. Are you guys excited about the new year? Are you cautiously optimistic? Are you hopeful? Are you like, woohoo? How do you guys feel? Let me know down below. So in today's video, which is actually technically deemed a Cinderella story, this case, or I don't know where the Cinderella, I know that they actually use this term in the investigations and stuff like that. And they call it like a Cinderella case or a Cinderella story. And that is when you have a stepson or daughter that is involved in a situation like this. So I thought this would be a good one to talk about today. There is some very valuable lessons that I think that we can learn from this very unfortunate situation. If you guys have never heard the story of Imani Moss or Iman Moss or Tiffany Moss, we're going to talk about that today. Imani Moss was born in April of 2003 to her father, Iman Moss, and her mother. Now, I think it is so cute and adorable and special that she was obviously named after her father. She was Imani and he was Iman. And I just thought that that was so beautiful and so sweet and so precious. Imani ended up living with her father full time. According to her father, he, his, her mother like had issues, substance abuse issues and signed over her rights and basically just left her. Now it was asked if Imani ever had a relationship with her mom. And he said, it was more like uh, her using the key as a pawn. And so eventually when he got full custody of her, the mother went off, allegedly disappeared and was never in her life again. So now Imani is being raised by her father, her single father, Imani and Iman. Mm, so cute. Teachers who knew Imani said that she was so precious and so sweet. She was very outgoing. She wanted to be best friends with everybody. There was even like a little story that was told where Imani tried to befriend the class bully, but the class bully kind of turned her down. But yeah, she tried. She was the type of person that just wanted to be friends with everybody. Very, very active and outgoing. Now, Imani would frequently attend church with her father, Iman, at Freedom Christian Church. They would go to church all the time. They had lots of friends there. They had family members that went there, and Imani would love to go into, like, the children's church area and play and run around. In 2007, Iman met a woman named Tiffany at his church. One of their mutual friends introduced the two, and Tiffany was allegedly in school at the time she was going to college so she would be in church a lot and sometimes she wouldn't be there and he just figured it was from school and stuff like that and they were friends and it was nothing romantic at first but as time went on they started going out to lunch in big groups you know after church any of you guys that ever waited tables you know how it is on Sundays in the afternoons around one or two o'clock you get a big flux of the church people right people coming from church to go out to eat and they were in one of those groups so they just became more friends and they were hanging out a lot more. It was said that Imani was very comfortable around Tiffany and Tiffany was very nice to her. Tiffany had no kids of her own at this time and eventually they started dating. Amon actually said that in late 2008 Tiffany just called him up on the phone and said hey you want to start dating? Like I'd actually like to date you not just go to church lunch and Amon was like sure. I mean he was a single dad with just him and his daughter. He meets this woman that has no kids, never been married, anything like that at church. They get along great. His daughter gets along great with her. Everybody knows everybody so he thought that it was perfect. Amon and Tiffany started getting serious pretty quickly. By the beginning of 2009 they were already engaged and by July of 2009 they got married. By this time they were both 
both working. Tiffany was working as a preschool teacher at a school she had already graduated college, according to her. And Amon was working two jobs. He was working a lot. They were making good money. They were having what they considered a good life. They lived in a home, just them three. And then in 2010, Tiffany finds out she is pregnant with a little boy whom they end up naming Tristan. So now they have this home. It's Tiffany. Amon, his daughter Amani, and now they have a little boy named Tristan. Everything was going good until Amon got a call from a police department one day while he was at work. He says, you need to come down here immediately. It is a family emergency and you need to come and talk to us. So of course, Amon tells his job that he has to leave. He packs all of his stuff up. He rushes down to the police department. Now, when he gets to the police department, he finds out that Amani, his daughter's school, had called the CPS or whatever it's called there and they had called the police department because Amani had shown signs of being abused. Amani's teacher had saw on her arms that she had these whelps on them and when they asked Amani what happened to them, she told them that she got a spanking. They knew it wasn't a regular spanking. These types of marks that she had on her was not from just like somebody popping you on the butt. It was from the metal part of the belt is what she had got beaten with and Amani told the police department that that she got in trouble because she didn't do her homework. So a full investigation was started and they actually arrested Tiffany. Tiffany was the one that had beat her for not doing her homework, according to Amani. While you were at the police department, did you find out that your wife had been accused of, of beating your child? Yes, when I got down there. Well, when they went into investigation and they dug deep into it, the courts were not happy. They did end up giving Tiffany a plea deal, though, for five years probation. So now she's on five years probation for doing this to her stepdaughter, abusing her stepdaughter. She loses her job, obviously, as a preschool teacher. She cannot have any kind of child abuse, neglect, or anything like that. Any kind of char any kind of violent charges on her record and still work with children, which is scary to think about anyways. But nevertheless, so she lost her job, and now she's on five years probation. And according to Amon, things got really tense around the house. So then what happened was the courts came, and they removed Amani out of the home, and they put her in the home with her grandmother, which was Amon's mother. So she Amani stayed with her grandmother for six months and during this time Amon and Tiffany had to do like all of these you know anger management classes and in-home counseling and all this different stuff which they did do now while Amani was living with her grandmother according to her grandmother she thrived she was doing so good in school she was doing all of her homework she had lots of friends she was running around playing she was eating good she was alive and happy and thriving Amani's grandmother begged her father which was actually her son to just let Amani live here. Just come and let her live here. She doesn't want to go back home. She's not comfortable there for whatever reason with Tiffany, the things that are going on there behind closed doors. Like she's thriving here. She's doing good in school. Let her stay here. And Amani's dad said no. And when he was asked later, why didn't you just let her live with her grandmother? She said, he said, it was just my pride. I just couldn't, I couldn't let her stay there. So when they finished up all of their stuff six months later, they took Amani and they brought her back home. And this is what I'm wondering. If this woman is still on probation for five years and this is his her victim, how did they let her move back in with her? That, that seems so bizarre to me. But nevertheless, let's just keep going here. Right around the time that Amani was able to move back in with her father and her stepmother and her little brother, Tiffany became pregnant again with a little girl named Emma. So things started getting really tight and tense here. Now Tiffany cannot work, okay? She's also on probation for five years. The only person that's working is the father, which is Amon. He's working two jobs. He's working his butt off. I mean, he said that he felt like he just goes to work. He has a break in between. He eats. He goes to a second job. He did have weekends off, but when he had the weekends off, he would, you know, come home and watch all the kids and take the load off of Tiffany. And Tiffany would go out with her friends. She'd go out partying. She'd go to her mother's house. She'd go do whatever. She was just like, take these kids. Shoom, and she would like run and bucket and leave him there with them, which he was totally fine with. He was like, you know, he wanted to spend time with his kids because he worked all week long. And so it, it worked out for him in that way. Well, because they were so tight on money at this time, they end up moving back in with her mother. So his mother-in-law at this point. So now they're all living in this home. They live here for a while. It's super crowded. Again, it's tense. She can't work. There's five of them plus her mother, six people living in this little house. And so they were able to save up enough money to get an apartment in a 
apartment complex and they all move out and move into this apartment. Now, when they move into this apartment in 2012, the apartment complex worker called the cops because they said that Amani was saying that she did not want to go home. I guess she had gotten off the school bus or whatever and she was in the office and she was saying she was scared to go home. She did not want to go home. So they called the cops to come in and talk to her and check on her. When the cops came, Amani said that for punishment, that her stepmother, Tiffany, would tie her to a chair and put her in the shower, a freezing cold shower. They could not find any physical bruises or whelps or anything on her, so they had to just chuck it up as, you know, maybe it didn't happen. They just didn't have enough evidence to do anything. There was different times that the cops were called and it was said that Amani had run away or that she, you know, didn't come home. She didn't want to come home. She was scared for whatever reason. Tiffany always tried to make it seem like she was just a rebellious little girl and Amon was struggling with this. I mean, he's a father. He's working two jobs to take care of all five members of his family and he has really no choice at this point other than to take his wife's word for everything or he felt like he had no choice other than that right around this time it was said that Amani was going through a major growth spurt her father Amon testified in court that when he would be home on the weekend she would eat constantly she would just gobble up everything eat 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 but she was so thin and he felt like every time he saw her she was losing more and more weight but all she did was eat. So he just figured, man, her metabolism's hitting. You know, she's she's going through this growth spurt where she's eating a lot and her metabolism is just on fire. When Amon got home from work one day, he noticed that his daughter's hair was cut. Now, Amani was known to have this long, beautiful hair. She loved her hair. She loved doing her hair. She loved putting little bows and little cutesy things in her hair. She just loved her hair. And her hair was cut almost completely off. And later it was said that one of Amon's family members, when she saw Amani, she first thing she said was what happened to her hair? And Tiffany said, I cut it because she was getting in trouble. So as a form of punishment, she cut all of Amani's beautiful hair off. As time was going on, Amon, the father said that he noticed that she was losing energy. She just was not herself. She was not lively anymore. They were not taking her around the rest of the family anymore. So nobody else really kind of saw what was going on they knew that something was up I mean her hair was cut they weren't coming around but they didn't exactly know what was going on the neighbors even testified in court that they saw the other two little kids outside all the time and, and playing and stuff but they only saw Amani one time the whole time they lived next door they only saw her outside once Amani's grandmother who was Amon's mother begged for Amani yeah I mean she said she's thin and she need to come stay with me and what did you what did you answer? In my pride, trying to prove my mother wrong, I said no. Deep down in the heart, I felt like it was probably the best place, but I didn't do it. When Amon would be at work, and obviously he trusted his wife to take care of his daughter, he said that he had no reason not to trust his wife to take care of all of their kids. They had they had three well, they had two kids together, and then they had Amani, who was obviously Amon's daughter from that previous relationship, which was Tef Tiffany's stepdaughter. And he said he trusted her to take care of his kids. He said that she, Tiffany would text him all the time when he was at work and almost every single time that she texted him, it always had to do with Amani. What were the types of text messages you would get? Um, um one incident said Imani, um, boo boo and put it on the wall. Uh, got another that got another call, taking that money um boom again and put it in the oatmeal in the food. Uh, uh get I get I'm just going down the list uh, different things. Or oh, money tried to run away. Would it be fair to say that a lot of the text that you got had to do with <coughs> Tiffany claiming that Monty uh, Monty was was misbehaving? Yes. Um, so you're her father. What did you do about that? I didn't do absolutely nothing. Did you believe your wife when she told you that? I did. Why? I don't know. I had questions, but I did. 
He noticed that Amani was getting very, 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 very thin, less energy, less energy. And at one point, I guess he said that he took her to the doctor because he, he said he took her to the doctor to see if she was sick or something. And they said that she wasn't sick. On October 29th of 2013, things took a turn for the worst and they would never turn back for the good ever again. Now, before I get into this, this is going to, this is the part where there's going to be a lot of details. Okay. And if you are too sensitive to these types of subjects, especially involving little ones, I absolutely understand. Please just turn off this video now. You, but cause this is, this is going to be a lot going on here. Okay. So on October 29th, 2013, while Iman was at work, he gets a text message from Tiffany who says that there's something wrong with Imani. There's something wrong with her. She's not doing too good. He gets home from work. He finishes off his shift, which let's keep going here. He finishes off his shift at work. When he gets home, he finds his daughter in the bathtub and she's having seizures. Uh, she, was, she was shaking, like, you know. Could she speak? Uh, she was trying to say something. She wasn't speaking much. She was, just, you know. Were, were her eyes moving at all? They, they were going uh, from left to right. So, after Tiffany said we can't call the doctor, we can't take her to the hospital, what'd you do with her? <sighs> Kept her in the room. I was trying to feed her, do a start, uh, uh, feed her. <laughs> Through a spoon with infamil. Okay. Huh. What were you trying to feed her? Infamil, like a like a liquid diet, whatever I'm working. Was she able to get up herself and go to the bathroom? No, sir. Um, was she going to the bathroom in the bed? Yes, sir. And he said at this point in his own words, she was beyond repair at this point. Amon testified that he wanted to call 911. He told his wife, we've got to call 911. And she said, no, 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 no. You cannot call 911. I'm on probation. Are you kidding me? Like she is, you know, we're going to, we're going to get in trouble. I'm going to go to prison here. They're going to obviously blame me and say I did something to her. Like we cannot call 911. He thought about it and he thought, man, I just can't lose my wife too. Like, what am I going to do? So he just left for his second shift and left her laying there in the bed and went to work to his second job. Amani laid there in that bed, not doing good. And six days later, when Amon was at work, he got a text from Tiffany and said, Amani is dead. She's gone. He again finishes out his day at work and then he comes home. He said when he got home and he saw her body there laying in the bed that she was cold to the touch and she was gone. It's cold. Her essence was there. Um, her eyes, she was gone. Tiffany again told him, do not call the cops. You cannot call the cops. If you call the cops, they're going to come in. They're going to take our other two kids. They're going to take me to jail. They're going to take you to jail. We're all going to jail. We're going to lose our kids. We're just going to have to figure this out together. And we'll just say she ran away. I mean, she's ran away so many other times. The cops will believe it. Like we've got to do it this way. And Amon, not knowing what to do at that point, and obviously not having any common sense, agreed with coming up with a different plan. So what does he do? He leaves and he goes to work to his next job. He just goes to work. The next day they wrap Amani's precious little body up in the, the bed sheets and the blanket and they move her into the computer room. They leave her into the computer room for a few days and you know, he's going to work and they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do, waiting, waiting until the weekend when he's off of work. And then they come back a few days later and they get her body out of the computer room and they put it back in her room in the bed. And at this point, rigor mortis has set in. So her little precious body, this is infuriating, is, has become stiff at this point. And they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. They've got to hide the body. They've, they've got to do something here. And so he decides that he's going to cremate her. So he goes to Walmart and he is seen on camera at Walmart and he gets a trash, he gets trash bags, black trash bags, lighter fluid, charcoal, and a big metal, one of those big metal trash cans, you know, and they decide they're going to put her body in it. But because of the rigor mortis, they are having to bend her body and wrap it in duct tape 
in order to keep her body in a position where they can get it in that trash can. They get her precious little body, put in the trash can, put the lid on it, and they put it in the back of his SUV-ish truck. They load their two kids up in there too. So it's Tiffany, Amon, the two kids in the back seat, and now precious little baby Amani in this trash can in the back of their truck. And they're driving around looking for a good place to burn it. Okay, they finally find a spot where they decide where they're going to burn the body and they take it out in a can, a secluded area, just them, and they set, they set the can on fire and he testified that it just burned and burned and burned, but there was no changes in the body. Now, you guys, and I learned this when I was researching this case, in order to cremate a body, like these, these places, these, you know, funeral homes and morgues or, or whatever it is that, do, that does the cremation, they heat it to like 1400 to 1800 degrees. I mean, these are not just fires in a trash can. This is not like burning wood in your backyard. 1400 to 1800 degrees to disintegrate. And it still takes a good hour and a half plus, okay, at that high of temperature to cremate a body. So when it burned and burned and burned, I think he said he let it burn for like 45 minutes, something like that, maybe an hour, somewhere around there. He realized it wasn't doing anything, so they put the fire out and they sit, had to sit there for an hour and a half and wait for the can to cool enough so he could put it back in the back of his truck so they could figure something else out. Once the can cooled enough, he puts it in his truck and they go back home and by this time, it's like Sunday, he's got to go to work the next day and so he has this can in the back of his truck you guys and Tiffany is at home with the two kids you know just going on I guess making macaroni and cheese and waffles for breakfast like nothing has ever happened and he is going to work with this trash can in the back of his truck with his baby girl's body now he said that he cried over the body so like when before when she was in the bed that he would go in and mourn every day between shifts you know his daughter and you know cry to her and say he was sorry and all of this but at this point now he's going to work and he's got this trash can in the back of his truck a few days went by and he just could not take it anymore one of his really good friends that he had known since he was like 10 years old he was talking to him after work and he told him, he told him, he said, what do you, he told him the story and he said, what do you think I should do? And his friend said, call 911, call the police. And he decided, oh my gosh, you're right. Like I've got to, like he had had this guilt obviously, but he was listening to his wife, Tiffany. And, and, and that is no excuse on his part, but still, I'm just telling you guys the story. And she was putting all of this on him about how they were going to both go to jail and she was going to, which they would have, they would have. Nevertheless, he ends up driving back home after he finishes out his shift at work. Lord, man, he's obviously a, a, a star employee at his job at this point. He drives home and he tells Tiffany, I'm about to call 911. I've got to call them. I've got to report this. And she starts, she flips out on him. She's like, you cannot, you cannot report this, whatever. He's like, I'm going to do it. She loads up her two kids in the car and she hauls butt and she leaves. She goes to her mom's house. Her mom reported that when she got there, that she took the kids. She's like, you got to take the kids or they're coming for me. They're coming for me. She changed clothes and she left her kids there with her mom. Amon called 911. The 911 dispatcher said that when he called, they were under the impression that this was somebody that was calling about a suicide, that he was talking about taking his own life or whatever. They were not, they were not sure if this was a homicide or a suicide. They were very, very confused. So of course they spent, they send dispatchers out there. They send the cops out to the house. And when they start talking to him, he's saying, you know, like he doesn't want to live anymore. He can't believe this happened, all that. They're trying to make sense. They're trying to calm him down and find out. And he finally tells them that his daughter's body is in the trash can over there. And while he's talking to one of the cops, another cop goes over to the trash can. He walks over there and he looks in the trash can and he said that when he lifted that lid off of that trash can he was stunned he immediately hit his thing and said put him in custody take him in custody take him in custody so they immediately handcuffed him obviously and they took him down to the station and he was under arrest when Amon got down to the police station he did not hold back he told it all he was just so relieved to just get it all off of his chest even though he knew he was in jail and he was not gonna get out anytime soon at this point, they're looking for Tiffany, and later, I think it was like the next weekend or a few days or something like that, Tiffany came down and turned herself in. Now, what happened from here is so strange, and I will leave some links down below for you guys. 
because most of the court proceedings is all online and please be aware because there's very gruesome details in there too way more than what i told there is some videos and some pictures and just a, a lot of information so you guys just proceed with caution what happened was Amon ended up testifying against his wife to spare himself of the death penalty. And he did, and he told it all. And we're going to get to more of that in a second. But his wife, Tiffany, she took it to trial and she chose to represent herself. But when she represented herself, she did not do anything. She did not cross-examine anybody. She did not hold any call any witnesses. It was so strange, you guys. She literally just sat there and let the state do everything against her and every time the judge would ask her do you need help are you happy or whatever she would say yes sir no sir, sir and all of that and they would say do you want to cross-examine this witness do you have any questions she would say no thank you but she didn't do anything to defend herself it's almost like she just wanted to make the state like spend their money you know taking this to trial like you're gonna have to work for it type of thing but had no desire in defending herself it was really bizarre okay now she was found guilty obviously and when they were taking the trash can example around or they were talking about different things and especially during the closing arguments of the prosecution a lot of the jury was crying like it was so hard to hear and you're looking at these beautiful pictures of this beautiful bright little baby girl that had her whole entire life ahead of her and you know her father she trusted her father to protect her and take care of her and it just wasn't done a lot of people failed her we're going to get more to that later too i'm trying to get through through this part of the story i got all these points that i want to make but like i said she was found guilty by the jury it only took the jury i think it was less than a couple hours or whatever they went and they found her guilty and they came back and they all agreed and then they all agreed later on the death penalty so she is sentenced to death however they are trying to get an appeal now and say that she was not competent to one stand trial she was not mentally competent to stand trial and she was also not you know because of the way she was responding and not you know defending herself that that's not something somebody with a sound mind would do so that's where we're at she's going to try to come back to trial the father amon got life in prison without the possibility of parole so he will be in prison for the rest of his life no possibility of parole but he did get spared the death penalty and so yeah so that's all that now let's get to some of these points here one thing is this is another classic case of the system failing this child along with everybody else okay i don't want to blame everything on the system because the system cannot save everybody okay i don't i don't want to do that however how was this woman literally on probation for five years okay this happened to amani in 2013 which means she was still on probation when you have a woman that is on probation for child abuse okay she's living with the victim nobody's checking on the victim nobody's coming up in that house and asking that baby girl nobody's looking at her like what was the probation officer doing that makes absolutely no sense to me i could even maybe even understand if you know maybe cps was called they came out checked the house and they left then we could kind of finally go okay cps but she was on probation for this and literally starving this baby to death in her own home and all this weight that she was losing she was starving to death she was not eating the only time she was eating was on the weekends which i question that too because if she was eating all this food on the weekends when they did the autopsy for this little baby girl's body oh it makes me so mad that baby had no food in her stomach zero none and I think it was her liver was like half of the size and her kidneys were like, she, she weighed 32 pounds, 32 pounds, you guys. And as a 10 year old little girl, they, they said she should have weighed upwards towards, towards like 105 pounds. And I agree, Jaden is nine years old and he's like in his eighties, something like that. Like in I, 32 pounds, you guys, there, you cannot tell me that people thought she was just going through a growth spurt. There was family members that reported that when they did see her, they saw her shoulder bones poking out and they were concerned, but they felt like they couldn't do anything because they were asking the father of her custody, but of course he wouldn't give it up because of his pride. The next thing I want to talk about is like, it is not just, I know we do a lot of stories over here where men do things and stuff and 
the women fall victim. It's not just men who do this type of stuff. Women do too. Women are very, very manipulative or can be. Okay, not all of them. Don't come for me, okay? But I'll tell you guys, just like I tell y'all when y'all want to know about prison, which is worse, men or women, everybody that I've ever talked to, correctional officers that have worked in prison say the women are worse, okay? It's not the physical aspect. Men will fight in a heartbeat. So will women. But women are manipulative, cunning, cunning and sneaky, okay? And in this situation, this is exactly how I see it. Now, this is my personal opinion. They're trying to say that Tiffany Moss had a brain injury when she was a kid and she has brain damage and that's what their new defense is going to be when they try to take this back to trial. She graduated college, okay? She was a preschool teacher. The mere fact that she told, this is my personal opinion, that she told her husband, Amon, do not call 911 because they're gonna take me to jail, like that, they're gonna take us to jail, we're gonna lose our kids, shows me right there that she has the cognitive ability to see cause and effect, okay? She knew that if he called the police, they was gonna arrest her for something. She knew cause and effect, okay? So you can't tell me that she didn't, she was so out of her mind that she did not realize what she was doing. It's not a situation where you see like the Turpin family. Okay, that mother who, it would take a whole entire video to, to really tell you guys my opinions on everything. But when the police busted into the house and found those 13 children that were had been neglected, she had no idea why the cops were taking the kids. She was shocked. Like, what are you doing in my house? Like, I'm confused. I don't. That is more of a mental issue of not realizing maybe to the extent. And she could have been faking it. I don't know. Okay, she still could have been faking it. I'm just saying. This situation with Tiffany, she knew what she was doing. Okay, everybody wants to play crazy. You cannot tell me. It's not like you, you in a split second, do something crazy and you hit somebody or whatever. This was long periods of neglect and abuse and watching this baby starve to death. She fed her other two kids. The other two kids were healthy and happy and well-loved. It was only her stepdaughter, the Cinderella effect or the Cinderella story. And when I also, I also want to say when I watched the father testify in court, Part of me felt bad for him. Y'all don't come for me. Don't. Okay, I got to tell you guys how I really feel. Now, I think he deserves to be in prison. I think he deserves to be in prison like he is, okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he he he's the victim or anything like that. But you could tell that maybe his thought, like he was manipulated. He was really, truly manipulated. And in his weird mind, he thought he was doing the right thing by everything. Everything he was trying to do was to protect everybody. And I and and but I also have a concern. Why didn't Amani go up to her dad and tell her dad what was happening? What was going on between Tiffany and Amani or between Tiffany and Amon that made her uncomfortable enough to not say, "Daddy, you got to rescue me." Right? But then two things become confusing or complicated because now he has two other children with her. Oh, you guys. I'll tell you what, and I'm going to leave this video linked below. The grandmother, which was Amani's grandmother and which was Amon's mother. I listened to her interview, man. And she is a God-fearing woman. I just wanted to give her the biggest hug. I just couldn't imagine, too, how she felt. Ugh. But as a, but at, even as her, as level-headed as she was, she said, they asked her in the interview, they said, should she have gotten the death penalty? And she goes, Bas basically more or less words, hey, I prayed about it. <laughs> and if that's what the jury said, honey, I asked, so it's in God's hands. Basically what she said in a nice way, like she was just, I just couldn't imagine you guys. Awful, awful, awful. Have y'all heard about this story? Have you heard about it? What do you think about it? How can somebody allow this to happen? Listen, you guys, it's part of the lesson for today. Do not let nobody mistreat your children. I don't care who they are. I don't care how many other kids you have with them. There is, there is discipline, okay? And then there is just straight up abuse. And if you don't know the difference, ask somebody. Call a hotline, you know? Figure it out. Protect your kids. They are defenseless. 
All right, my loves, let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. As always, my loves, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please do not forget to like it. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all on the next video. Love you guys. Bye.